Laurence Olivier ran a great acting company at the Old Vic to found the National Theatre. When Maggie Smith and Albert Finney are your leading juveniles, then you know you're in serious shape. But at the South Bank, Peter Hall added an extraordinary writing company. There were plays, nearly all premieres, from Harold Pinter, Samuel Beckett, Tom Stoppard, Howard Brenton, Edward Albee, Christopher Hampton, Tony Harrison, Athol Fugard, John Osborne, Peter Gill, Peter Schaffer, Robert Bolt, Charles Wood, Simon Gray, David Storey, Arthur Miller, Sam Shepard, Alan Aikborn, Edward Bond, and David Mamet, among others were quite so many interesting pale male playwrights ever presented together in one theatre. <laughs> On that day in 1983, when there were finally new plays in all three auditoria and all three were packed, then the idea of what a national theatre might be changed for all time. It was by no means predestined that it should be so. When he started the Royal Shakespeare Company in 1959, Peter had wanted to annex the Aldwych Theatre, not just so that his troupe might play in the capital, but also that he might present new work. He did not see a British classical company as being like the Comédie Française, with death the only criterion for entry into the repertory. <laughs> for Peter, the past depended for its shimmer on the light thrown by the present. Peter was never interested in purity. To him, impure art represented collaboration, struggle, and practicality. That's how he became, by far and away, the most constructive impresario of his time, creating new theatre cultures in the West Midlands, in Waterloo, and on the South Downs. He was as happy to host a legendary Guys and Dolls or a Yorkshire take on the mysteries as he was to insist personally on his own Hamlet, uncut, and his own Oristia, masked. All the greatest producers I have worked for have been the most controversial. Because they bring exceptional focus to the realization of what they want to do, they anger those who want something else. It is to Peter's credit that he infuriated so many including politicians, by his advocacy of state-subsidized ensembles. In 1989, when post-war idealism was getting its fatal shellacking from the government, Peter was first to understand, quote, the great experiment is over. He was lucky, he said, to have grown up when the state acknowledged its duty of care for the welfare, education, health and artistic access of all its citizens, regardless of whether they were born of privilege or as the children of station masters. Peter's loves were for family, music and theatre, perhaps increasingly in that order. But you always knew where his heart was. When Peter promised you something, he delivered. When the battle was thickest, he was closest. When the choice was between anyone else and the artist, he backed the artist. When Plenty opened to often disobliging reviews in 1978, the board of the theater told Peter to take the play off. He refused. When we have work which we believe in, he said, and which we know is good, we fight for it and we keep it on. Otherwise, what's the point of a national theater? That spirit of defiance marked out a deep artistic confidence which today seems magically of its period. His stubborn visionary sense of priority changed my life as it changed the life of many other actors, writers, and production teams. For 50 years, Peter's tenacity gave the British theater the frame in which we worked. The best way the only way of honoring his memory is for, is for us to aim to give as much as he gave. <laughs>